So this is a quick presentation to describe the processes of osmosis and diffusion. The two processes are connected, but you must understand the differences between them. First, we're going to start with diffusion. If you first think about diffusion, the concept that is usually introduced is the idea of spraying some deodorant or some perfume or something like that in a room. Imagine you spray this in one corner of the room. The result is going to be you have a lot of this stuff, this smell is going to be just in that small area. But pretty quickly, it's going to spread throughout the room and before long, you're going to be able to, sp you're going to, be able to smell this wherever you are in the room. The terminology we use for this is we begin with a high concentration just where we spray the stuff and we've got a low concentration somewhere else. In this example up in the right hand corner we've actually got none of it. What will happen is it will move from an area of high concentration towards an area of low concentration. What's actually happening is the particles are moving anywhere and everywhere, absolutely wherever they want. They're not trying to move towards the area of low concentration. They're moving absolutely everywhere and in any direction. The result is that they will eventually fill everywhere, including the area of low concentration. We can describe this, this change, this difference between high concentration and low concentration as a concentration gradient. All that means is there is a difference. We've got high in one place, low in another, it's a gradient. So the worded definition that you need to know here is diffusion is the net movement of particles from a region of their higher concentration to a region of their lower concentration down a concentration gradient as a result of their random movement. Remember, these particles aren't trying to go to the area of low concentration, they're going everywhere and that includes the area of low concentration. This is the random movement part. So next we're going to think about what might determine the speed that things can diffuse at. Let's go back to our example of perfume or deodorant sprayed into the air in a room. In this example you can see here, on the left hand side we've got the perfume which is represented in yellow, as yellow particles, and all around the room, we've got a lot of air, separate, uh, represented here by the blue particles. Just like before, simple idea, we've got an area of high concentration and an area of low concentration. A good way to think about this gradient that we were describing is to simply look at it like this, this triangle here. On the left, we've got lots of it sloping down towards the right hand side where we've got very little of it. Or in this example, we actually have none of it on the right hand side. Because we've got such a strong difference, having lots on one side and none on the other side, we've got a steep concentration gradient. The difference is very significant, so we can call it a steep concentration gradient. Let's compare that with something less significant. We've got a difference. We've still got high concentration on one side, low concentration on the other. But as you can see, it's not quite as extreme as it was in the first example. We do actually have a little bit towards the right-hand side, albeit less than you've got on the left. Convenient way to visualize this would be we've got a less steep sort of triangle. So we can simply describe this as being a, a more shallow concentration gradient. So what does this have to do with rate of diffusion? Well, if we've got the more substantial, more significant, more steep concentration gradient compared with a more shallow concentration gradient, the speed will be different. In a steeper concentration gradient, we'll get a faster rate of diffusion. Bigger difference in concentration, faster change. Simply the opposite applies, shallow concentration gradient means that we've got a slower rate of diffusion. Okay, so that's mostly what we need to know about diffusion. So let's move on to this new concept of osmosis. Now, osmosis does involve the movement of areas of, with lots of something to an area with less of it. But in this example, we're focusing specifically on water. This is what we're using in our example. The process is slightly different. Let's look here at this example of these two different boxes. They are separated, they are two different boxes, they each contain water, represented here in blue. They also contain salt. 
How much of this will move from one side of the other? Well, in this exact example, nothing will move because we've got this line down the middle. We've got this barrier here. But let's change this. Let's put a permeable membrane between the two. We call it permeable, meaning things can go from one side to the other. We call this example partially permeable because only some things can move. Here, our salt cannot move across the membrane. It can't fit through the spaces. This is really similar to how things will work in living cells. Water can usually move quite easily across, but other things won't be able to move so freely. In this example, however, our water, as you can see, can move and it does. On average, in this example, it's mostly going to move from the left hand side to the right hand side. And you need to understand why. First of all, you've got to understand these two these ideas, high water potential, low water potential. What we mean is we've got more stuff that's not water on the right hand side. On the left hand side, we've got a large amount of just water. We can't talk about concentrations of water here. That It doesn't work like that. We can't talk about the concentration of water. It's just water potential. And water will move from an area of high water potential over to an area of low water potential. If you want your word of definition, this is what you need to understand. The net movement of water molecules from a region of higher water potential to a region of lower water potential through a partially permeable membrane. If we talk about an area of higher water potential, we mean that the solution is more dilute, meaning there is less stuff. In this example, less salt in it. If we say it's got a low water potential, the water potential is low because it has more of this extra stuff, this extra salt, so it's concentrated in terms of salt. If you don't understand that, we're gonna see an example now which will make it a little bit more clear. Let's think about a simple plant cell. You've seen this a lot of times before, it's a very basic structure. Let's consider what happens if we put this into different concentrations, different water potentials. Let's look here, we've got fresh water which has high water potential, salt water has low water potential. Let's do a quick reminder of why this is. Salt water is basically, as it says, water and salt, okay? It's got a reasonable concentration of salt compared with fresh water, which is just pure. We've got less concentrated and more concentrated. Realize high water potential means less concentrated, low water potential means more concentrated. In this example, more concentrated in terms of salt or less concentrated in terms of salt. Or in this example, it's actually got no salt, so there's zero concentration. So, let's see what's going to happen if we put our plant cell into each of these. The fresh water has a high water potential. By comparison, the cell inside has a low water potential. It just means that the water potential is less than it is on the outside. Remember, water goes from an area of high water potential to an area of lower water potential, which means it's going to go into the cell. Our cell is going to fill with more and more and more water. As a result, it's gonna to start to get bigger. It's gonna become more solid, more full of water. Exactly the opposite is true for our salt water. We have a low water potential on the outside, which means by comparison, the inside has a higher water potential. Remember, the cells in each example here were exactly the same, but it's by comparison. The inside of the cell has a higher water potential than the salt water. As a result, water will go out and our cell could end up looking something like this if the water potential is low enough. Before we go any further and look at some numbered examples, we've got to get a little bit of the terminology here. The freshwater example, the cell has become a lot bigger and it's become a lot more solid. We describe this as being turgid. The saltwater example, the cells become a lot softer, a lot more loose. We use the word flaccid for this. You'll notice that all of the, the important insides of the cell have come away from the outside 
in the salt water sample. This process is known as plasmolysis. Now let's quickly look at how this might be a little bit different with an animal cell. We're looking at exactly the same scenario again, exactly the same water. If we drop the animal cell into an area of low water potential, the water is going to go out and it's going to end up quite shriveled and quite small. The freshwater example is going to be different from our plant cell. What can actually happen to the animal cell is it can burst open. It will fill up and fill up and fill up until eventually it bursts at the seams. It will literally tear open the membrane. The reason for this is there is one crucial difference between the plant cell and the animal cell. The animal cell has no cell wall. Plant cells do, animal cells do not, meaning it doesn't have that extra strength, that extra reinforcement. So it will get destroyed by high water potentials. Okay, let's look at a quick example of what happens if we put so if we put plant cells into some different concentrations of solution. We're going to look at sucrose solution. Basically, we've got 0% sucrose solution meaning it's just water. 10% sucrose solution meaning it's water with a little bit of sucrose. Sucrose here is represented by these yellowy orangey colors. The 60% sucrose solution is the same again, but there is more sucrose. It's that simple. Think back to our water potential. The 0% sucrose solution has got high water potential because there's more pure water. There's more of it is just water. Go further over to where we've got higher concentrations of sucrose. We've now got a low water potential because there's less water in one area. Remember, this means low concentration in the high water potential. It means high concentration of sucrose in the low water potential area. Let's see what happens. If we put a plant cell into 10% sucrose solution, to be honest, probably very, very little will change. The water potential inside the plant cell is roughly the same as it is on the outside, so we wouldn't expect to see anything particularly unusual. If we put our plant cell into the 0% sucrose solution, really high water potential outside, low water potential inside, the water goes in, the plant cell becomes very, very turgid. Put it into a really high percentage of sucrose solution, something that's got a really high concentration, it means that the outside has got a very low water potential, the water leaves the cell, meaning that the cell becomes very flaccid, and we might see plasmolysis occur in a concentration quite as strong as that. So, in this example, as we've got a higher water potential, it's going to result in a more turgid plant cell. If we've got our lower water potential, it's going to result in a more flaccid plant cell. And this is the, the basic concept you've got to know about osmosis.